Greetings, everyone. We're so excited that you have joined the All African People's Revolutionary Party New Mexico Chapters monthly um, Pan-African monthly film series that happens every second Saturday of the month at 2 p.m. Today, we're going to be showing the heritage of slavery. Um, with the film series, what we do is we show a short film, and then after that, we do a discussion. So we'll have some questions that we'll ask. Um, normally the film series we would do in person, but because of the pandemic, we wanted to make sure everyone was still safe. So we've continued to do it, but uh, virtually. And so afterwards, we want you to drop questions in the chat. We want you to share uh, your insights. So what the um, film talks about is it, it talks about 
the legacy of oppression for the first part of the film. So after um, the Pro uh, Emancipation Proclamation, you get to hear from um, Africans from their perspective of what happened. You get to also hear from Europeans. Um, for a warning, um, there are some things in the film you will hear that will really um, frustrate you, which is a good thing. And also after that, you'll hear from Fannie Lou Hamer talking about sharecropping to organizing. And then you'll also hear from others who are um, teaching uh, young people about like being in the revolution and why um, like organizing is critical for us to um, provide for our needs because we know in this society under capitalism, our needs will never be a priority um, in this country or any country until capitalism is um, abolished. And so thank you so much again for joining us. The film is about 54 minutes. And after that, be here for a discussion. We'll ask questions and you can participate through um, chatting. Boston, South Carolina has a beautiful harbor and a historic one. The Civil War began here with the shelling of Fort Sumter. And even before the fleet was beaten back at the harbor entrance by American revolutionary troops. Thanks, I forgot. But there to is another history here. And it has its viewers. own kind of sure troops. Two boatloads of them once starved themselves to death in this harbor rather than enter Charleston. Another 40,000 of them were rushed through this port in one three year period so they could go to work in America for nothing. They were Africans, but in this country, they were taught to look at themselves another way, as slaves. Charleston is one of America's oldest cities. Much of the city is lovely, and much of its loveliness is the product of slave labor. But Charleston, like the rest of America, learned very early that if it was going to have slaves, it had better sleep with a gun under its pillow. Like other immigrants to America, the slaves were huddled masses, but unlike the others, what blacks were huddled against was America itself. Often, they rebelled. Quite often. Partly in order to deal with inside agitators, Charleston put walls and fences all over the place. It turned out that if you bought a slave, you may have bought yourself an insurrectionist. Today, all over America, there are still echoes of the noises made when one race tries to subjugate another. We will explore the heritage of slavery and the roots of black rebellion. Twenty Africans were landed in America in 1619, one year before the Mayflower. By 1860, there were four million black men, women, and children, the private property of white America. The new world meant possession to the white man. It meant dispossession to the black man. Slavery was an attitude as much as a condition, and attitudes, like land, can be inherited. On the plantation outside Charleston, where his family has lived for eight generations since 1672, Norwood Hasty was asked if he thinks slavery was immoral. No, no, I don't. Because, it, because uh, when a slave came from Africa, he couldn't speak the language. He was totally untrained to do any, any job at all that would fit in with the civilization. Someone had to take care of him. Someone had to take care of him 24 hours a day. And, and it'd be, it's pretty hard to, to do that unless you owned a person. So I think slavery just had to be in those early days. Mr. Haiti, what was life like in those early days? As far as the colored people were, con were concerned, I feel that they were a good bit happier than they are now. They had less in the way of material things. But I can remember back in the 20s, when I was a small boy, they were always singing at their work they had a great sense of humor. And now today, they just don't seem to care much about that as, the, as, as they used to. And I think they've lost their sense of somewhat, which I deplore. What do you think are the differences between the races? I think there's a refusal to accept 
responsibility. I think there's a lack of motivation. I've tried here to promote people to foremen, superintendents, but they just refuse to do it. They just don't want the responsibility. They don't worry like the, the white man. If they have troubles, they go to sleep and wake up the next morning, and that trouble is over. Is it possible that white people have something to do with the lack of ability for blacks to assimilate into this culture? Absolutely. Uh, the white man has certainly been prejudiced and to quite an extent unfair. But customs die awful hard. It takes, takes a long time. And everyone knew years ago that the Negro would have to be given equality. But in the South, knowing Negroes as we think we do, we realize it would take time. It's, it's been compared to, to straightening teeth. It takes a slow, steady pressure. You can't do it with a hammer. And, and white people's attitudes will change in time. I'm a lot more liberal than I was five years ago, and I know I'll be a lot more liberal five years from now, and I think almost everyone else is in that category. What has tended to make you more liberal? Well, realization that the Negro is a human being like anyone else. Mr. Hasty, what did you think we were before you began to think of us as human beings? Well, in a, in a way, we thought of you almost as a very superior pet something or rather someone we had to take care of because we had to do so much of their thinking for them. We had to do almost everything uh, for them that, except living their own, own lives. Anything outside we, we had to do for them. If masters did the thinking for slaves, it is not recorded who did the thinking for masters. Most Southerners didn't even own slaves but they became victims of the glamour surrounding big plantations. Today, there is talk of equality in the future, but it is the romance of the unequal past that still infatuates and torments much of Charleston. For blacks, that past is a little thin on romance. It is true that in a home like this one, Scarlett O'Hara might have lived. And a home like this might have contained an overseer like Simon Legree. But it is an absolute certainty that if I had been around in those days, I would have lived right here. And that, for an increasing number of black Americans today, is what American history is all about. The process of slavery began in Africa. The slave trade was very rewarding. New Englanders made quick fortunes, and African profiteers, who were not exactly soul brothers, sometimes helped them. A black captive was marched overland to the west coast of Africa, where a molten branding iron gave him a new instant identity. It was found that if you strip a man of his culture, prevent him from learning a new one, and separate him from his family, it does not take him too long to start feeling like a commodity. The West's naval architects competed to design slave ships where more men could be packed into less space. Gustavus Vasa was a slave who later bought his freedom. A reading from his diary recalls his abduction in 1756. The sight of the ship filled me with terror when I was carried on board. I was put down under the decks and there with the loathsomeness of the stench and crying together, I became so sick and low that I was not able to eat. Two of the white men offered me eatables and on my refusing to eat, one of them held me fast by the hands while the other flogged me severely. The closeness of the place and the heat added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. The air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered a scene of horror almost unbelievable. When they reached America, slaves found auction blocks waiting for them. Any slave could be sold at any time. Slave markets were very effective socially. 
they broke up the black family. But even if you were a commodity, you remembered the last time you saw your mother. A slave described his own sale in 1858. My brothers and sisters were bit off first, while my mother, paralyzed by grief, held me by the hand. Her turn came, and she was bought by Isaac Riley. Then I was offered to the assembly of purchasers. My mother pushed through the crowd to the spot where Riley was standing. She fell at his feet, entreating him to buy her baby as well as herself and spare her one child at least. Will it, can it be believed that this man was capable of disengaging himself from her with such violent blows and kicks as to reduce her to creeping out of his reach? I was then five years old. Slaves were sold at several markets in Charleston, and one of them has been meticulously preserved for visitors. Recently, a biracial committee was formed, and it has worked hard to build a new link between whites and blacks. Very little of what American cities have come to think of as racial turmoil has occurred in Charleston. But underneath the graciousness, old relationships are often found intact. Descendants of slaves work for descendants of slave owners. Mrs. Lionel Legg retains the tone of a past she cherishes. So Daisy was my little playmate, my maid, my friend, and the daughter of old Catherine, who was a cook that we adored. And so all those years, we played together. And everyone was happy. We, we never heard of all these things that we hear about today. And there were nearly 100 an enormous rice plantation with many animals around and a beautiful old house and about a hundred colored people there. But we loved them, they were our friends. And, and then it's no disgrace to say they're like children when we, say, when we say that. It's because they are like happy children, some of them. Because they like to sit in the sun and rather than work hard. And that's, and they'd rather work, play than work. If you could, would you paint a picture for us of what it was like on the plantation in your early days? It was a lovely, happy time living in open spaces with many lovely colored people and animals and flowers and fields. My father had everything thoroughbred from the pigs, the horses, the dogs and the people had to be thoroughbred. And we would get into a buggy with them and drive to the plantation from what we call the pine land where we live. And we would spend, uh, every Saturday this was, and we would spend the day in old fortune, I can see him now, would give us dinner and we would have a heavenly time. And old April, he was the dairyman, that's all he did was to all he did was to skim the cream over these great big, big bowls of clabber and put them in the wooden churn and churn this marvelous fresh butter. That was April's job. He didn't do anything else but love us and, and skim the cream. <laughs> the southern white man just loves to say that, oh, our Negroes are happy. They, they like it. They like the way things are. If other people would just leave them alone, there wouldn't be any problem. And some, I think, really believed it. And I think that that's one thing, perhaps, that sort of thrown them off balance when all of a sudden their Negroes just weren't behaving the way they thought they ought to behave. You were just a doormat. And that's where the good relations came in. As long as you're a doormat, we have wonderful relations. They just felt that until recently, relations between the Negroes and white were just so very good. Just wonderful relations. It's outside agitators. And yet, it never occurs to them that they were good on whose terms? On their terms. Those terms have been dictated by a white aristocracy that has ruled the South for almost 300 years. The aristocrats said slavery was one of mankind's noblest inventions but it was a nobility often maintained by violence. If a slave got beaten enough, some of the milk of human kindness was likely to drain out of him. The master got mad at me and he buckled me down across a barrel and whipped me till he cut the blood out of me. It felt like I would die, but he owned us body and soul and there wasn't anything we could do about it. When the master died, we were called in to look at his coffin. 
We all marched by him slowly, and I just happened to look up and caught my sister's eye, and we both just naturally laughed. Why not? We were glad he was dead. Slaves began running away in the 1600s, but the principal method of escape wasn't formed until the 1800s. It was called the Underground Railroad, though the journey was usually on foot. Harriet Tubman, the railroad's outstanding conductor, would walk innocently past a plantation, singing Steal Away to Jesus, and the slaves would literally steal away to Philadelphia or Boston. Wherever there was slavery, there was also resistance. The revolutionary movement among blacks began long before the spirit of 76. Until 1800, slavery was legal in the North. New York City had a massive slave insurrection in 1712. There were at least 250 recorded slave revolts in America. The most effective insurrection was led by Nat Turner in Virginia in 1831. Turner and his fellow revolutionaries killed 60 white people before they themselves were captured and executed by state and federal troops. The South was terrified. Owners decided they had better be protected from their property. Slave laws became more severe. In 1850, Congress lent the South a hand by passing the Fugitive Slave Law, allowing Southerners to come north to reclaim their runaways. But resistance had its own momentum, too. It was articulated fiercely and with finality in the famous appeal by David Walker, a free black man living in the North. I ask one question here. Can our condition be any worse? Had you not rather be killed than to be a slave to a tyrant who takes the life of your mother, wife, and dear little children? I speak, Americans, for your own good. We must and shall be free in spite of you. You may do your best to keep us in wretchedness and misery, but God will deliver us from under you. And woe, woe will it be unto you if we have to obtain our freedom by fighting. Throw away your fears and prejudices, and we will love you more than we do now hate you. What a happy country this will be if the whites will only listen. On the site of an old church in Charleston, the most daring of all slave revolt was planned by a freed slave named Denmark Vesey. With 9,000 supporters, Vesey intended to capture the entire city of Charleston, but he was betrayed by a house slave. The Reverend Henry Butler inspires his congregation to be proud that slavery was met by insurrection. So Denmark Vesey, an anti-slavery leader, 1767, 1822. He was an insurrectionist, so they tell me. He organized an unsuccessful slave revolt here in Charleston, South Carolina. He and 34 other Negro conspirators, so they call them, were hanged. But it was here, on this spot, in a little old wooden structure downstairs, that Denmark Visa planned his insurrection. Yes. And then as now, some of the people could not keep a secret. And I can sympathize because our forefathers were taught not to keep anything secret from the master. And there was a servant who told the master of Denmark Visa's insurrection and of his plan. And of course the plans were broken up and then South Carolina passed a law closing all schools and daring Negroes to be caught reading, and this place was closed. Yeah. When we think of those that were hanged, yeah. those that were persecuted, yeah. those that were killed, those that have had hose and water poured on them, those that have had bloodhounds on their trail, those that have been mistreated, and in the midst of it all, somehow they stood up because they had a spiritual backbone that caused them to look beyond the temporary things of life. If we are to move in this new day, we cannot have backbones like a jellyfish. 
What is man? Man is a part of God. And each man is a thought of God. And each man is entitled to be recognized. And we trust that in the future, we will not have to do what our fathers had to do. But if necessary, we have to do what is to be done. Doing what he thinks must be done in Charleston is what Bill Saunders, a black activist, worries about. He finds the past too close for comfort. Although it is more than 100 years since the end of legal slavery in America, Saunders believes too many whites act like masters and too many blacks feel like slaves. Old slave, master, and slave condition that existed 100, 200 years ago is still here in Charleston. We, as black people, were brought into this country for slave labor. And we have worked as slaves from the time that we were brought into this country until the present time. I'm fighting so hard for black survival because I believe that this country is getting to the place that they don't need that labor anymore. And since they don't need that labor anymore, they don't need black people anymore. The past has taught me that I got to do something to survive here. And this I feel like, you know, a lot of us gonna have to start exactly how we feel about the situation. We really got nothing to lose, really. We ain't got no jobs to lose. We ain't got no business to lose. The only thing that we have got to lose our lives. The man been taking that anytime he wanted. The thing that I am saying, or that I am preaching, that instead of going to jail for the man all the time for nothing, if you're going to go to jail, go to jail, go to jail for something. Make, make, have yourself a plan and make something count when you do go to jail. This is the, this is the type of program, but you got to, you got to, the thing that we don't have, we don't have no program to go to the man and say, this is what we want. But there's a lot of things in my past that I'm guilty of. First, my parents were black, and then I was born black. You're not guilty, you know, of no crime at all except for being black. The white man is my oppressor. He's the one that controls the jail, he controls the hospital, he controls the army, he controls the navy, he controls everything. And he's the man that I have to fight. White America's got to wake up and realize and listen and understand that not only black folk got to make sacrifices, but white folks going to have to start making sacrifices. Some sacrifices to make this country what it's supposed to be. Other than that, there's not going to be no country. Every man, woman, and child in Mississippi can rationalize how they have always been friends to the colored man. All of a sudden, they wake up here one morning and, and, and are told that what the way they've operated for the last hundred years is wrong. This is a hard thing to just tell a man that he spent his life doing something wrong. He doesn't have to believe it. And then all of a sudden, we're some kind of demon. If you, if you live in Mississippi and run a cotton plantation, you're supposed to be some kind of demon. This is the national image of a cotton plantation operator in the Mississippi Delta. Humphreys McGee owns a 2,500-acre plantation in the Mississippi Delta. His mother's family has been in the state for seven generations. And on his father's side, the McGee's move to the Delta from South Carolina, Charleston, was the elegant capital of Southern culture in the 19th century. Mississippi was the frontier. Attitudes hardened early. The old way of life has endured in Mississippi longer than anywhere else. Whites and blacks in the Delta look at the past from different angles, but it is a shared past. See, the Civil War is over, and regardless of the evils of slavery, these people understood each other. It was not um, some sort of medieval torture for a person to be a tenant farmer on a plantation, and I don't know anybody that's ashamed of the system, the way it worked. Um, it's, it's, it's an impossible system to return to. With that mechanical cotton picker, one man could do what 150 men had been doing. This was the crowning blow to this system. Everything's geared to machinery. Where I used to have 83 families on the plantation, I have 15 boys working machine operators. But I, I will say that the system we had was a system that, on the surface, developed a very outgoing, happy group of people. 
they're old people now. But that's, this, these are the people that, that I grew up thinking I knew. I worked hard. He worked hard. I worked hard, hard, hard. I'd get, out, get up at 4 o'clock and get my breakfast done. Just at dawn of day, I'd go to the field and be pick cotton. Mr. and Mrs. Haywood Jenkins of Shockey County, Mississippi, have, between them, picked cotton for over a century. My boss man came along. He says, uh, Mary Jane, I said, sir, says, I say, when you wash? I said, I washed uh, last night. He said, I don't want you to do that no more. That's my agent, you know. He says, every Friday morning or Friday evening, you wash. I'd, and let all the children stay there with you until you get through. When you get through, then y'all can go back to field and wait. Now, the agents was mean, some of them. Some of them was mean. They wanted to hook the, hook the colored people. And that time, the white man come along. He says, hey, but you ain't in the field yet. He just had started the plan. He said, yes, I've just not had to eat my dinner. God damn it, you ain't doing a goddamn thing. He says, uh, God damn it, I ought to take this damn stick and frill the hill out you. He said, no, he said, if you frill hell out of me, God damn I frill hell out of you. <laughs> Make me feel bad if I was under them, you know, how mean they was to treat us like, treat us like that. In the frontier days, slaves begged not to be sent to Mississippi, where their work was almost as harsh as the overseers. Resistance was often subtle, but seldom absent. A runaway slave said that each so-called happy song was a testimony against slavery and a prayer for deliverance. Put some kind of a scout down on that corner. Yes. This system, in its best sense, was based on uh, noblesse oblige by the landowner. But I don't have 83 families anymore that I feel like I'm the daddy of. I do not expect to ever have this relationship with the younger generation, the, the children of these men. They are. Uh, oriented entirely differently. They grew up in the 50s. They're, they're conscious of the change in the status quo. They, they are fairly confused about what their position is. They don't want to be subservient. From when I saw my mother and father and my brothers do while I was growing up, I feel that I don't want any of my kids to come in a world like this because I know some days I saw my mother slaving from 6 in the morning in hot sun, 100 degree weather, from pulling a hoe in a field from 6 until night with about an hour's break between us all this time. And my father doing labor that, that, that machines wouldn't even be made to do hardly. Doing labor that bad. And I feel that if we've been working this long and can't even own the shirts on our back, I feel that we have to take some drastic steps some drastic steps to make something happen, to make a change come about, because Mississippi is going to either have to change or there can't be no more Mississippi. And we have to do this in any means as possible. Through our parents, we've earned Mississippi. It's no question about it, brother. I mean, if, I, if my mother got there and sweated from morning until night, and you tell me I don't own anything she sweated on, I mean, how can that be? How can it be? The white man does not want to give over his institutions. And that's what people fear that would happen. You just don't want to turn over the reins of everything and give up control. Who wants to give up control? Come on, we're out. Okay, guys, get in the car. Let's go. 
So white supremacy is undoubtedly a feeling that white people have all over the world. Of course, how the black man and the white man would live together has been the paramount concern of people ever since the Mississippi Valley was settled, especially when the greatest number were the black people. The problem is I don't need the men I used to need. Humphreys McGee can run his plantation with machines now, and the government takes care of surplus cotton. That leaves surplus people, and no one does anything about them. They cluster into shanty towns like this one in Cleveland, Mississippi, and they wait for something, almost anything, to happen. First as slaves, and then as tenants and sharecroppers, black Mississippians turned the Delta swamps into the richest plantation soil in the world. Now the soil and the crops no longer need the people. The mechanical cotton picker, an instrument of agricultural efficiency, became also an instrument of history. In many Mississippi counties, blacks have always been in the majority, which means whites have had a problem. If you've got the land and the money, but not the numbers, it's natural, as Humphreys McGee says, to want control. In Mississippi, white control has made the past hard to distinguish from the present. More than anyone else, the spirit of resistance to this control has been Fannie Lou Hamer. At the 1964 Democratic Convention, Mrs. Hamer was a leader of the attempt to unseat the regular Democratic delegation from Mississippi. Mississippi is still a very rough place, you know. Um, people is not just walking up like they used to do in the past, walking out. You know, shooting a man down or getting maybe two or three hundred people carrying you out and lynching you, but it's it's in a most settled way. Um, you know, they can let you starve to death, not give you jobs. These are some of the things that's happening right now in Mississippi. See, Mississippi is not actually Mississippi's problem. Mississippi is America's problem. Because if America wanted to do something about what has been going on Mississippi, it could have stopped by now. It wouldn't have been in the past few years, 40, uh, between 40 and 50 churches bombed and burned. You see, and this, this, you know, this lead me to say, you know, all of the burning and bombing that was done to us and the houses, nobody never said too much about that and nothing was done. But let something be burned, you know, by a black man. And then, my God, you know. You see, the flag is, is drenched with our blood. Because, you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. We had to live on it, but we've never wanted it. So we know that this flag is drenched with our blood. So what the young people are saying now, give us a chance to be young men, respected as a man, as we know this country was built on the black backs of black people across this country. And if we don't have it, you ain't gonna have it either, cause we gonna tear it up. That's what they saying. And people ought to understand that. I, I don't see why they don't understand that. They know what they've done to us. All across this country, they know what they've done to us. This country is desperately sick, and man is on the critical list. I really don't know where we go from here. May I have your attention, please? Bring on coach, not only go main... Where many black Mississippians are going is north, over 400,000 since 1950. What is finally breaking up the old relationships in Mississippi is not enlightenment, nor revolt, nor the civil rights movement. It's just machines. And when the machines came, many of the blacks had to go. past all adds up to is the present. 
Chicago is the present for as many as 1,000 black immigrants each month. The railroad isn't underground anymore, but the objective is still the same. Nobody seems to migrate anywhere without some combination of hope and bewilderment. After 300 years, the huddled masses are still looking for what eluded them in the South. Jobs, freedom, a different way of life. But the migration itself has created tensions and the polarization of attitudes. Well, bigotry means that you believe in a creed, a cultural stem of life, a, a way of life, and this I do believe in. I believe that we have uh, communities here we've developed in, the, in our country that we have to protect, and I believe a community way of life has been developed for 75 years, and I don't believe it should be broken up. And I think that this is the way we'll have to fight for it for, from now on in. It's going to be a community life versus those that want to come into it, and that's going to be rough. And if this means racism, it's going to be practiced on both sides. So you're practicing bigot, then? I'm a practicing bigot. I believe in my way of life. As far as I'm concerned, things are getting worse in America. I haven't seen where American did nothing for the black people. Why have American did? Uh, if you're a few Negro who would have a position, a higher job. That's still not helping the grassroots. I'm in the grassroots. My little brothers around here are in the grassroots. My sister is living in the grassroots. She's still living in the grassroots. As a young black man, I feel that I have an obligation to my race of people, not to no other race and no other nationality, just to black people. The south side of Chicago is not a nice place to visit, and it isn't easy to live there either. The situation is not new. Over 100 years ago, a brilliant black abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, escaped from slavery to come north. Douglass found that black people were already being crowded into large urban slums. Today, 85% of Chicago's black population live in ghettos. What the black man who leaves the South faces when he comes to Chicago is described by the Midwest director for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, John McKnight. In the South, uh, he knows who the man is, the man up there on the hill in the big white house. And when he comes to a city like Chicago, uh, it's much harder to determine who that man is. It's such a complex society. It's a different man who controls the house from the man who controls the job, from the man who controls the welfare, from the man uh, who controls the hospital, from the man who controls the school. And I think what's happening is that he comes rather quickly to the conclusion that the man is all the white men. Not being able to discern his specific captor, he decides that all people with white faces are his captors. And to the degree that all white people are engaged in supporting the systems of separation and racist institutions that we have in the North, that judgment is basically accurate. How do these institutions function in a racial way? When we develop any kind of a system that by definition excludes people who are poor, inner city, limited education people, we are saying black only. We might as well put the sign back up because it's the same thing, same bag. The problem that we have in white America is that most white people, when they hear about white racism, well, most, most white people say, man, that's not me. I never discriminated against anybody. Never did. And in their sense of what discrimination means or what racism is, they may be right. But they sit residing in a system from which they take full benefit a system that defines them in and, and defines black people out, we are going to have to face the fact that we are not a community. A community is where a lot of people develop mutually beneficial relationships with each other. And our racist institutions and the political boundaries of our cities define black people out of the community. White people will sit in their suburban homes and watch their television programs 
and hear about all of these uh, laws that are being passed. Many of them are beginning to uh, wonder, uh, well, what is it with those colored people down there? Why, why are they so upset, all this, all this wonderful stuff that we're doing for them? But we aren't focusing on the black man living on the block. He lives in a, in a, uh, in a two flat on that block. And he knows what the circumstance on that block was 10 years ago. Oh, and he knows what it is today. And he, too, has heard about all of those programs and laws being passed. But the hard fact of the matter is that things are not changing for him. It's no wonder that the white population and the black population are pitted against each other when the black man knows that the change is not coming and the white man thinks that major efforts are being undertaken when they are not. So I don't think anybody should be surprised when one sees the black people in an open attack on the system because I, I suspect that they don't see that there is any other realistic alternative. James Turner, an instructor in political sociology at Northwestern University, also teaches a summer study group what black patriotism means to him. Denmark Vesey, the insurrectionist of Charleston, is Turner's lesson for the evening. What Denmark Vesey did in Charleston, South Carolina, is very much related to Detroit and to Watts and to Newark. It is very much related to black men saying, Tanks be damned, I'll have my freedom. But the price of freedom is not cheap. Denmark Vesey was very mindful of this. So it's very important for us, the lessons of Denmark Vesey. A lot of us like to think that the effective thing is to woof at the man, to get up and blow our whole game to him, that somehow the revolution will come through oratory. The unique thing about B.C. is that he was a quiet man, which is often a mark of determination. Yes, sister? How come this wasn't taught in our school? I think that this is a very good question. Why it is that Denmark B.C. doesn't stand beside Patrick Henry? Because they've never wanted us to come to the kind of position and the state of mind that those of us who are gathered around this table have come. Because Denmark B.C. released in his time, as he has done for us now, a whole force of black resistance and struggle. We have not been able to talk about, because they're nameless and faceless, the thousands of black people who fought in a more quiet way. Those black women who consigned to cook in the kitchens of the slave master, who ground up glass to very fine bits and put it in the master's soup. And then ask the master, what's the matter, boss? You seem like you're not well. And the white man was tricked by his own notion that our people were just silly as he bled internally to death. <laughs> as well as the brothers in the field who set fire to the cotton. The brothers who set fire to the cotton when the master came with his whip and said, boy, what's going on? I don't know, master. Something's are taking place strange. <laughs> and the brother went on to burn more cotton. Black people have resisted. Who have determined here today that we are going to free our people. Denmark Vesey is alive. Denmark Vesey is alive and among the brothers, be they in Oakland, California, with the Black Panthers. Denmark Vesey is a young black man named Eldridge Cleaver and Huey Newton in Oakland, California. Denmark Vesey is personified by the, the courageous black brother named H. Rap Brown. Dem Denmark Vesey is the guiding light that inspires and gives incentive to brother Stokely Carmichael. Denmark, Denmark Vesey was the father of brother Malcolm X. Denmark Vesey walks the streets of the black community today. He is in the minds and the bosoms of young black men
who stride now with pride and dignity in the black community, who say that they will no longer reside in the hell of the ghetto, but will, tr will struggle to transform their, their plight to a community. They will do it or die trying. That there is a fever of revolution in America, and that it's a black revolution. The only thing that is hanging us up, which we must clear, we must sit down and continue to analyze and discuss what our particular role will be in the revolution. Calvin Lockeridge, a young ghetto leader, moves his training group toward confrontation with a system he finds oppressive. For Lockeridge, the heritage of slavery is insurrection. We talk about that all revolutions are led by a hardcore disciplined group. And I think this is where we have to start. We have to start organizing that hardcore disciplined group of people. And then we pyramid ourselves. And then we move, we will move the masses of people around an issue when we are ready to move. You have to have your own communication. Well, well this is how the uh, rebellion during slavery uh, was able to uh, move to action is because of the fact that you had uh, members of the revolution or the rebellion who would move and uh, communicate through the black grapevine. Because you never knew how many people was actually involved. Because it meant death if you were ever found out. A lot of uh, Negroes, they might have thought that they were given a chance, but they weren't. There's going to have to be some bloodshed and a revolution somewhere. I think you know, the black people have always had a justification for insurrection, rebellion, revolution, whatever word you want to call it. You've been talking about guerrilla warfare. Now you're saying that we should start preparing for guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare takes training. And I don't, I don't know of any black person around who has done any type of training to prepare himself for guerrilla warfare. If one prepares himself for guerrilla warfare that you wouldn't know, I would hope no one would know. Yeah, and this is true. Guerrilla warfare is not a training in the use of weapons. It's a training in the use of the mind. There's a revolution going on. Anyone who doesn't join in, who is in the way, you treat him Don't as a traitor or a spy. And doesn't sympathize with you, he can't help you. You have to treat him like a traitor or a spy. That means you kill him. That it's an American revolution. Yeah. It's happening here on the American soil. And that black and white are caught up in the revolution, but blacks are spearheading in the revolution. Neither James Turner nor Calvin Lockeridge could win any elections today. So far, they represent only a minority of a minority. Yet their potential constituency can be found on any sidewalk in any slum. Among youth and among black opinion leaders, even a minority is many thousands. The question posed by increasing black activism is, Will white America respond before the few become the many? Chicago is 30% black, while less than 1% of the city's businesses are owned by black people. It is hardly a revelation that economic bondage produces social revolutionaries. The future may not work, but if you're black, neither did the past. The pressures that bring about rebellion are defined by the senior editor of Ebony Magazine, historian Lerone Bennett. Men uh, fight when they reach the wall, not because victory is sure, but because their manhood demands that they, that they, that they, that they act in this way. And therefore, I, I, I'm not at all sure what is the proper measure of success when you're talking about a rebellion of an oppressed people. Uh, one might almost say that, that um, it, it, it is normal for an oppressed people to revolt. And it is abnormal, really, for them to accept the oppression which is forced upon them. Any oppressed people, when they revolt, revolt really in the ultimate sense, even in the name of the oppressors, because they're reestablishing reciprocity between man and man, and they're reestablishing the bounds of humanity which must govern men if they're to live together in a common I just ask you to visualize a room, you know, which there are all the goodies of the world, all the material goodies of the world. And there are people in that room, and all those people are white, you see. And uh, 
The door to that room is locked. And that room is in a building with a hole. And in that hole are people. And all those people are black. Now, black people have been standing in that hole for more than 200 years, knocking on that door. And they've been saying, please let us in. You know, we want to be with you. We want to be like you. We love you. And that door has never opened. One of the men in the hall say, you know what I think I'll do? Say, I think I will go outside, get me a brick, throw it through the window, and take some of my things out of that window, because he's never going to open the front door. And another man in that hall says that, um, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going outside, I'm going under the house, I'm going to take me a match, and I'm going to burn that house up, and everything in it, including me. And then a third man says that, um, wait, brothers, you know, might become necessary to do that, but it's not become necessary yet. Said, the problem is we've been standing here for 200 years knocking on that door, and he hasn't opened the door because we haven't been speaking his language. So his mother tongue is power. And that perhaps if we take all our little toothpicks of power and put them together and create a whole huge battering ram, then the door will open one way or another. I think history arranged that it eventually America would have to face itself through black people or go under. Uh, and, and I deeply believe that, that, that this is the point we occupy now in time. A suburb of Chicago, July 4th, this year. If you're white, try to think black. For 200 years, blacks have watched white parades roll by. For most Americans, the past itself has been white. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are the champions of American independence, but they were also slaveholders. Patrick Henry wanted liberty or death, just like Denmark Vesey and the young men in the ghettos today. But Patrick Henry was also a slaveholder. Freedom, like history, is not supposed to have a color. But when America institutionalizes freedom and history, all the symbols are white. Black America is still waiting for the parade to open its ranks and let in Frederick Douglass, Denmark Vesey, Malcolm X, and other heroes of the black fight for freedom. Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave, was once invited to celebrate July 4th with white people. He told them, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. When white people celebrate black heroes, as black people have celebrated Washington and Jefferson, the battle for the past will be over. And when the past belongs to everyone, so will the present. Most black people still don't want to wreck this parade. They want to join it. In the heritage of slavery, there are plenty of heroes, just like in any other tragedy. Deep in the wasteland of Chicago's south side, embedded like an emerald in an ash can, is an immaculate wonder called the Wall of Respect. Black artists painted black heroes on this wall, men and women willing to liberate themselves, in Malcolm X's words, by any means necessary. They are individuals who will either have respect or will die trying to get it, and some of them have. It's a long way and a lot of years from the slave market in Charleston to the Wall of Respect in Chicago. But neither distance nor time has yet entirely separated the black man from bondage. No one needs to inflame the black race against these realities. The fire of rebellion started burning a long time ago. What these travels in black America have shown is that white racism created the need for black power, just as slavery bred insurrection. If a country can be a collective noun, then America is mad at each other right now. We blacks and whites are plotting separate courses with great skill and cunning. You can't have oppression without rebellion, and you can't have either in a country that belongs to all its people. What black Americans are telling white Americans today is that this land is ours too. The plaintive question the slaves used to ask, am I not a man and a brother? has been replaced by an affirmation and a challenge. I am a man and a brother, black men are saying. 
And if you don't think so, then this country isn't big enough for both of us. This is George Foster at the Wall of Respect. After all, a slave was a very valuable piece of property. And anybody with any brains at all would have kept him well clothed and well fed so that he could do his, his job. But of course, they didn't figure the slave really as having too much of a soul, I guess. He was more of a beast of burden, almost a very superior pet. The heritage of slavery is what we're living through today in the Mississippi Delta, in Newark, in Watts, everywhere. That's a heritage of it. I believe that. Thomas Jefferson did say that I trust. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining All African People's Revolutionary Party for the monthly film uh, screening today. Um, All African People's Revolutionary Party, we're a massive organization um, organizing, working to organize a one unified socialist Africa. Um, no matter where our people are, wherever they're African, they are oppressed, they are exploited. Um, and so we know that in order to stop that, we have to organize at a massive level to um, not only get our land back, but for our people to be free. And we just got a chance to watch this film. Um, thank you so much for folks put, um, dropping information and knowledge in the comments about um, the film as you were watching it. And so um, in the beginning, we, we see this notion about um, our ancestors um, being, um, what's the word, while they were enslaved, um, being happy, right? There's this falsehood, there's this notion. So what do you all think is the purpose of why Europeans continue to share these falsehoods that um, slavery was a happy time for our ancestors? And I'm gonna post that question in the chat on YouTube as well as um, Facebook. Um, while the film was showing some comments that did popped up was um, about uh, like uh, talking about like we're a superior pet because they had to take care of them. Like that never happened. They never took care of us. Um, so I see those things. It also talking about how as long as we we're a doormat, you know, um, that's how they wanted to treat us. Uh, responses, they're trying to justify, um, they're trying to justify what they did to our ancestors, right? So this is falsehood that our ancestors were happy during while they were enslaved. So they're trying to, that's one response saying they're trying to justify their actions. Yeah, there is, there is nothing. Um, our ancestors, um, not only here, but wherever they were taken, they were enslaved, they were exploited, they were beaten, they were tortured, they were raped. Um, we, we heard the story of, of uh, um, an older man remembering when he was five, like his siblings just being just stripped away and sold and like the mom begging to just stay with one child and her being beaten, right? Our people were name it, like those things happened, unspeakable things happened to our people. There was no such thing as a happy time while people, um, where our people were enslaved. And we know that slavery never stopped, right? We know that it continues to happen all over the world. It happens in incarceration. It happens, our people are still even lynched by police. Um, our people are enslaved in Africa, in Haiti, like wherever our people are, we know this stuff has not has not stopped. So yes, definitely agree. They're trying to justify it. Um, another comment said that they can accept responsibility um, for something, um, right? That didn't happen. So that definitely resonates. You know, um, so if there, um, if there's this falsehood that everything was happy, then they don't have to take responsibility, and that's not true. Like even they have um, the plantations, right? They have uh, tours. And depending on where you go, especially Florida, the way that they uh, um, describe it in the tours is just so many, so many falsehoods. And it's again exactly what that comment just alluded to. 
um, they don't have to take responsibility for their actions of, 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 of torture, um, of horrific acts, definitely agree. Um, oh, so um, Onya Sabu just made a comment about Slimmer to the Falsehood where they said the land here um, and in Africa was empty when they stole it. Yeah, so we also know like they kidnapped our people from Africa, um, enslaved them here, tortured them here, and our people built this country on stolen land, right? And indigenous people um, faced uh, genocide and tremendous acts of violence as well. And so it's, um, that, that's also like, uh, when I think about that is the riches, the richness that was, and resources that were stolen from Africa to not, to build many different countries, in, um, as well as our people like contributing to the building of this country. And the young man in the film talked about um, like, we don't own nothing, right, in this space. Um, and him watching his mom work at six in the morning to the end. And just imagine like, and, and we still don't own it, right? Because this is all actually indigenous land in this country um, and our land belongs in Africa. And so um, our, our people are in like certain roles, like in representation roles, but none of those roles help our people as a collective. And that's what that young man was talking about. He was saying, we are the grassroots. My sister's not being helped. I'm not being helped. We're not being helped. So just because there's a few uh, millionaires um, that are Africans or a few people who are governors or mayors or whatever they are, that is not helping our people as a collective. Our people have less home ownership than they did in the 1950s. Our people um, have disproportionately killed by the police. Our people are um, disproportionately um, incarcerated as well. So the next question I, I um, kind of started talking about a little bit is um, why is, uh, so, hold on, sorry. Um, so representation has been sold to us to assimilate in this country, right? To assimilate deeply. And we have, um, we've had an African president, we have an African vice president. We, um, depending on like uh, cities that people are that have predominantly African people, they have people that are African mayors. And so why is, um, why does representation not change the conditions of our people as a collective? I'm just posting both questions in the chat. Okay, sorry about that. My son's trying to nourish himself and um, just during a different time. <laughs> and so um, um, a response is the system is made to exploit us. It doesn't matter who's in it. Definitely agree. Um, so this system, no matter what, because it was made from jump um, to oppress our people, no matter who's in what role, um, our change as a collective will not happen, right? And that's also what some of the other organizers like James Turner um, and a couple others were saying as well. And so no matter what roles um, our people are in, whether they're in political positions of power, it's perceived power, right? Because our people, everything's controlled by Europeans, hospitals, banks, um, schools, police, the injustice system, the prison industrial complex, like everything is so controlled. So systemic racism is embedded in every single aspect of our lives. Like not, no type of role that our people can hold can change the conditions of our people. Like look at the highest position, um, like the presidency, which is actually still controlled by 
by the massives, right? Look what happened under the um, Obama administration. Like, look what happened with Africa and what's happening in Africa and our people, um, you know, being murdered in Africa. Look what happened around like the housing market. Like nothing happened for our people as a collective. Nothing changed for the betterment of our people, even in that role. Um, and even in the film, this was made in the 1960s, 1968, um, one of the young people said, things are getting worse. And like things have continued to uh, get worse for our people. It hides, you know, it, um, it, it can hide if you're not paying attention. And so that's really important to know. Yeah, other thoughts? Someone just made a comment about um, Robert Allen spits it out in Black Awakening in Capitalist America. Yep, yeah, definitely. Um, that's what this country is all about is capitalism. Um, another comment said, because representation praises the individual and individualistic endeavors and liberal ideology, which does not liberate people. Yes, yes, um, that resonates because it's like you, um, one person, one person like arises to that space, but it's not about like being collective. It's like that, in, and that's also part of white supremacy. White supremacy is really embedded in individual um, like ideology um, as well. And so it's not thinking about people as a whole. So that's reminding me of Denmark Vesey. So Denmark Vesey was talked about from the Reverend, from um, James Turner. And with Denmark Vesey, what happened was Denmark Vesey was able to, he, he won the lottery and purchased his freedom. But he saw how his people were still being oppressed. Other Africans were still being oppressed. He saw how he was a second class citizen. So even as a free man, right, who had purchased his freedom, he was organizing Africans um, to rise up and have an uprising. And over it was over 9,000 Africans were involved. And what happened during this time was, and the, the, the Reverend talked about it, how um, because of internalized oppression, internalized oppression, one of the av other Africans, you know, told one of the Euro European slavers what was going on. And so the uprising was not able to happen they were able to stop it. Um, over 130 people like got incarcerated, 37 people were hanged, including um, Denmark Vesey. And so what he was thinking about was the collective of his people. He didn't think about himself, like I'm free, that's okay, I'ma keep moving in this world. He could see the bigger picture of what was continuously happening. Not only was he seeing himself as a second class citizen, but the people around him and how people his people were being oppressed and treated. So he could have just stopped and, and just kept going on. But no matter what, like we're, no matter what level of position that we are, we are always going to be treated differently in this country because that's how this country was created. And so um, appreciate learning more about um, that uprising that was attempted. Um, and also speaking of internalized oppression, that is so why it's important for us to decolonize, for us to learn political education, because we have to address internalized oppression and we cannot accept, um, well, this is how it's always been. We cannot accept these conditions. We have to organize and fight for change. Like they're not just gonna hand us our freedom. They're not just gonna hand it us our, our, um, our liberation. You know, um, Fannie Lou Hamer also spoke about that as well. Um, there's another comment saying the conditions of our oppression are the same conditions that made us so-called representation. Oh, that's deep. Why would they fight to undo a system that gave them everything? That's real. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And also representation is this false illusion of like us being empowered as well. Um, so one thing I think appreciated about Fannie Lou Hamer being in this film is um, Fannie Lou Hamer started out as a sharecropper, was an organizer in SNCC, and, and they were doing voter registration, but trying to build something new for the people. 
and um, they were in Mississippi. And in Mississippi, um, a group of African women, including Fannie Lou Hamer, they were jailed. They were beaten and she was beaten so badly. So the um, uh, European police officers, um, these pigs made uh, two African men beat her. They beat her nearly to death. Like they would get tired and they would just start beating on her again. So they beat her nearly to death. She went blind in one eye and they, they beat her with, I think it was, might've been like brass knuckles. Um, they didn't call it than that. They called it something else um, back in the day, but she got beat so bad it contributed to her long life health condition. So this happened in 1963 and I think she passed in 1977. So she had permanent like kidney damage and she had continued health problems and she still kept organizing for the liberation of her people. She um, also organized um, like on farms, like helping farms develop. She also built housing, 200 housing units for people. So she, even um, though she went through um, just like, uh, like, man, she almost died. They literally beat her to death. She continued to organize for the um, liberation of her people and unfortunately ended up dying due to the injuries that she suffered in 1963. Um, so Fannie Lou Hamer also like embodies um, like the need to organize because she knew like they just weren't going to hand um, hand our people freedom. The next question I have is um, why is uprising and organizing like the like um, critical um, to fight for our liberation? Um, Um, and freedom. And when I'm thinking, and with this question, I'm also thinking about no matter where Africans are, they're facing tremendous harm. And so it's not just about our African people here in this um, country, um, United Snakes, it's like Africans everywhere, no matter where our people are. So why is um, uprising and um, why is organizing critical to fight for our freedom? And so in the film, we, we learned about um, examples of resistance, um, but I also wanna just you know, share as people are thinking of their responses is um, the film also talked about our people fought for resistance no matter, no matter the time in history. So when our people were kidnapped on the shores of Ghana, when they were kidnapped on Africa, they were fighting back. When they were on these ships, they were um, on slips where they were enslaved, they were fighting. So there's over 500, 500 documented um, incidents of our people fighting back on ships. And then when they were brought to this country and then other countries, there were also uprisings and, and fighting back. And, and we rarely learn about those things, right? Um, and and um, I think it was James Turner, one of the young people, she asked, why don't we learn about those things? And um, when I think about it is like us learning about um, our struggle and our resistance um, uh, allows us to see um, ourselves in our ancestors and they don't want that, right? So when he was talking about Vespi is, is Malcolm X, Vespi is Kwame Ture, you know, is us, like people who are organizing for the liberation of our people. That was really powerful because they don't want us to see how our people struggled and fought um, for freedom. So why do you all feel it's important for us to um, fight for the liberation of our people? Um, there's a comment that says no one else is going to do it. Like, that's right. Like, who's going to um, care for our people? Um, Malcolm X said, we're outnumbered. We're not outnumbered. We're out organized. 
yeah, that's even what that racist European said, you know, who was talking about his workers or his boys talking about how um, Africans were outnumbered there in Mississippi. So we're definitely out organized and no one else is going to fight for our freedom but us. No one cares and loves our people like we do. Um, and I know while we were enslaved and being conditioned in white supremacy, um, that was being stripped away from us. Like um, our culture, who we are, collectivism, it was all being stripped away from us, but it's in us, right? It's in us. It's the, it's the nod when we see one another, right? Walking. It's the smiles that we give one another. It's in, it's in us. You, you know, when I meet Africans and we're having discussions about capitalism, um, and it's maybe their first time learning about it and learning about um, um, the bigger picture. They they know it's wrong because they have seen like what poverty has done in the community. They have seen the Democratic and Republican Party um, both are the same system um, to continue to create laws and policies and conditions where our people um, are continuing to suffer under so many different things. And so we know, we know that it's critical that things have to change. Um, and I, and, but learning how we make that change together is important. Um, one, um, here, there's another comment in the chat that says one African organizer in the movie pointed out that we're becoming a disposable population to capitalism if we don't fight back now. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, we we see, you know, even in this pandemic that's happening, we're still in the pandemic, you know, over 600,000 people have um, unfortunately died because they were not trying to save us. You know, Cuba had immune boosting medication that this country could have access to if it wasn't for the blockade. Over 21 countries had access to that resource and, and Cuba gave that resource for free. Um, but, but the majority of people that were dying during the pandemic were African, indigenous and Chicano, right? Capitalism does not care about us. They don't care, um, they want us to be um, disposed, disposed of as well. Um, yeah, and and we, we see that all the time. and. And the other thing I, I forgot to mention about Fannie Lou Hamer, it made me think about it, that like we're gonna learn about what capitalism does to disposable population is like, they've also done the sterilizations of, of, of women, of, of, of colonized women, um, people of color um, throughout time. And so that even happened to Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, so she went in for a surgery and they gave her a hysterectomy. Um, and so she ended up adopting two daughters. She could never have children. So, you know, capitalism, it, you know, also tries to, um, you know, it will do anything to oppress our people. It will do anything to kill us. It will do anything because they know we're like colonized folks. We outnumber them. We outnumber Europeans. And once 10% of this population is organizing, it's over, right? But we have to be like massively organizing to create change because they don't want that. Uh, another comment in the chat says, we need to build more infrastructure for our people to feel safe and to build upon our futures. Yeah, and so, you know, in, in this country, there's so much violence that our people face. And so like community defense is really important. Like we have to be able to protect our communities. We have to be able to feed one another. We have to be able to care for one another. We have to be able to um, organize together to see the big picture. And the only way we can do that is coming together. There was a comment earlier about gentrification um, in this country. And one thing that gentrification did do is it um, moved us away from one another, right? And so like that central hub locations that we had to organize often doesn't exist. And so we have to build it. We have to build those hubs back again in the community where we can come together um, to, to, build, to build those things um, where that's safe communities um, and, and other things and beyond. 
um, and learn about our learn about history, learn about the resistance that happened, and learn about how how we can continue to resist as well. So those are the like few questions that I have prepared um, for this discussion. Do others have any questions or any thoughts um, as you were watching the film that you're thinking about, whether that is about um, the, the nonsense that Europeans say about slavery, um, whether that's about um, organizing to build something better, um, or does this connect to any of the work that you're doing in the community? I'm just taking a look at my notes here from the film and seeing if I, um, there was so much to talk about here. So many different like metaphors, um, you know, the Haywood, the Jenkins, the Jenkins, they talked about, you know, they had picked cotton for over a century and, and what they experienced. Um, but like what really stuck out to me is, uh, man, that young person who was talking about the grassroots and saying that we're gonna have to take drastic steps to make something happen by any means. And of course, using you know Malcolm X as any means. And so that just really resonated because we wouldn't be where we are if our ancestors didn't fight back. So our ancestors were fighting back while they were enslaved to, where we, to, to, to be where we are now. And our people are still facing dire horrifics wherever they are and so like we have to take the steps to change something because no one's going to do it that was a comment earlier but us no one's going to do it no one's going to make it happen and so um that's something that i'm walking away with is the continued resistance that our people have so um even though we may carry the the pain and the trauma of our ancestors we most importantly carry their resistance. And so that's something for us to know and carry with us that that resistance is powerful. Um, that resistance allows us to see um, like all of the, the like our people were facing so much and they still fought back. They were facing like, man, I, I can't even imagine. And they were still resistance, resisting, and so I'm. I carry that with me, um, just learning more about um, Fannie Lou Hamer in this film as well, um, and learning more and hearing from other ancestors talking about their own experience um, during these times. So that's something I'm definitely walking away with is, is just, and just so continued gratefulness to our people. Uh, the film was recorded in 1968. There was a question asking about it. So it was recorded in 1968. And someone's commented that the film rings true today. So there's definitely things that, um... greetings, greetings, thank you for being here. Well, we're gonna be ending the discussion and ending today's Pan-African monthly film um, screening. Again, it is every second Saturday of the month at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. We're gonna be excited to be showing another film um, in September. So come back and join us. We'll be having a discussion. We just appreciate you all sharing your time, sharing your thoughts, um, sharing your anger, right? And also sharing your passion and commitment toward community and toward liberation as well. So thank you all so much. If you are not part of an organization, we encourage you to join an organization. 
you can also join uh, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, we are all over. If you are in New Mexico, please contact us. We need, we need you. We can only create change um, in our communities by organizing, by joining a movement, by joining an organization. So we say stay ready for the revolution and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Every day from the moment I wake there are thoughts that stay on my mind Is there really a way to keep faith in our hearts when it seems